So I'm uh, Josh Mackauer. I'm the director of the Stanford Biodesign uh, program. I'm actually one of the founders uh, going back 20 years ago when Paul and I first uh, conceived of a training program uh, focused on helping uh, people innovate <clears throat> in the, the healthcare field, uh, specifically with respect to healthcare technology. And um, it began as a, as a small fellowship and then a, uh, a two semester graduate class and has expanded uh, over the years. And, you know, we've literally trained thousands um, and, uh, and sort of inspired uh, many, many programs across the world to do the same. Uh, it's, it's a basic methodology that, um, that really helps clinicians and, and others, uh, engineers, business people find their path and really address all the stakeholders. Um, now, most of this uh, work has been focused on adults um, because naturally that's tends, the adults tend to get diseases more often, but it's, you know, it has occurred to us that um, the needs of, uh, the pediatric needs, maternal needs are exceptionally important. Uh, and uh, that requires focus. And I wanna just congratulate Dr. James Wall, who has led uh, uh, many efforts here, um, Pediatric Device Consortium, others, uh, in really raising awareness of this and driving um, specific activities, uh, funding efforts, new companies, et cetera, all focused around pediatrics. And we're very fortunate to have folks like him and Janine Furch and others um, who are dedicated to this area. So we're, we're really excited about the opportunity for innovation in the pediatric field and also in the maternal health field. And I myself as an entrepreneur have, uh, have invented and created companies in that space as well as the uh, inventor of the first wearable breast pump for, for women uh, called Willow. Uh, where I'm a founder and chairman of the board. Um, so let me turn my comments to really introducing our next speaker. Uh, really uh, a fantastic and um, amazing example of someone doing something so impactful and identifying a business model that uh, that is exceptionally powerful to create change. And you know, there's a there's a sort of a uh, a misunderstanding or let's say an unfortunate um, uh, challenge that many uh, technologies and companies sometimes face, which is how do you really create a exciting new venture uh, in the pediatric space when the market uh, sometimes can be perceived as, as, as very small. But Kevin has gone on to create a go check as the CEO uh, and founder um, leading, a, it's a legit, leading digital health company um, with really the first solution uh, that's called Go Check Kids, uh, which is saving children's vision and uh, and really expanding uh, very rapidly. Oh, today, over over six thousand pediatric teams in the United States and Europe trust this app to prevent vision impairment, and uh, and you know they really are. Um, this this company is really making tremendous change and improving the quality of life for kids and you know, uh, late detection in this situation can often lead to um, learning disabilities, blindness, even death. And so it's it, the impact that Go Check Kids has had for early vision, uh, you know, not only the clinical ones, but also with its ability to reduce costs by over 60% is really, really commendable. Uh, Kayvon has uh, a, a history of being a successful entrepreneur, having founded um, a health technology venture alongside uh, Nestle, and then also co-founded and grew a company called uh, GenPlay Games, which is a leading mobile games uh, developer that's generated over 40 million in sales and, and also been exceptionally uh, successful as well as fig.com, which is a healthy habits app um, that's today used by over 50,000 people. Um, so he really is a digital innovator. Um, and now his focus on kids and, uh, and the pediatric population is, is exceptionally commendable and a great example of success. And his, uh, you know, his track record is well understood and recognized, having appeared in many, many um, uh, various public media and uh, re report business reports over the years. And, and uh, we're proud to say that he received his MBA from Stanford, so we're going to take a little credit for that. And uh, with that, I'll welcome Kevin. Uh, to this uh, to this talk, and thank you very much for uh, this great keynote. We're all very excited to hear your comments. 
Josh, thanks so much for the opportunity and the very kind introduction. It's, it's an honor to be uh, back at Stanford, Stanford in a way. Um, I'm actually in Cleveland today, um, meeting with the large hospitals out here, um, partially because there's no substitute, of course, for being in front of customers and learning from them. And um, of course, there's nothing like being you know, with pediatricians and, and seeing the amazing work they do. And partially because we have a new um, sales rep and there's no um, you know, better way to not only learn how to support them, but to get them up to speed faster um, than to actually be with them as they're meeting with, with hospitals um, in some ways very similar to Stanford. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Wall asked me to focus on, on the big business side of growing a pediatric technology company. Um, and so today I'll focus on two of the, the biggest components um, that really both spring from what Josh was talking about around it being, you know, in quotes, a, a small market. Um, by way of background, uh, when the board and the large investors behind GoCheck asked me to take the helm of the company, I said, you've got the wrong guy. Um, you know, I've done a little bit in terms of digital health, but um, never a clinical application, um, never a product that was regulated by the FDA. Um, and I've never sold to hospitals. And they said, well, you've got other assets to, to help move this mission forward. Um, and we're convinced you're the you're the right person. And so um, I tried to dissuade them otherwise, but eventually, you know, they were successful. And they were successful because of a few reasons. Number one, um, I recognized firsthand that you know pediatrics and children in particular don't get enough innovation investment. Um, I know that firsthand because my own daughter was diagnosed very late for pyloric stenosis. She wasn't assimilating virtually any of mom's milk months after being born. Um, she was way below her birth weight and she was, uh, we were very close to losing her. Um, you know, the emotional and physical impact on her and my wife and I, um, not just over the next year of kind of nursing her back to health, but, uh, but afterward, uh, you know, took a pretty, had a pretty large impact on my wife and I. Um, and as an innovator, of course, I started thinking about, you know, is this something I want to actually do, do something about? And, uh, of course, when, when GoCheck came knocking and I realized that one in five children has a vision impairment and vision impairment is uh, inversely correlated with learning outcomes and income outcomes and long-term social determinants of health. And I learned that, uh, of course, some of these children actually die like from retinoblastoma. Um, in fact, we, we, we are hearing more and more from pediatricians uh, who have caught retinoblastoma with our product, um, I realized that if I really care about human flourishing, which I, which I claim to, joining GoCheck um, is not something I need to think any more about. In other words, driving the adoption of GoCheck kids would probably be the most professional thing I could do with my career. Um, I'm almost five years in, and it certainly has been. When I joined, we had a couple hundred pediatricians, and we had, um, they had screened tens of thousands of children um, today, we're approaching 7,000 pediatric teams, and they've screened over 5 million children. Um, and of course, we hear stories all the time about kids whose lives are transformed because you know, we've decided to focus on pediatricians and the children they serve. Um, the, the product, this is not a commercial for the product, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but until we came along for decades, there had been technology available to catch vision impairments in children early while they could still be treated, but the technology was not affordable and it was not efficient from a workload flow standpoint. And so we solved both of those things by creating a digital uh, vision screening app that's on the iPhone, uh, which obviously leverages from leverages the incredible economies of scale associated with Apple's global manufacturing. Um, and so we're able to charge our customers nothing, zero upfront. Um, as opposed to our competitors charging you know, seven, eight thousand dollars up front. That's one of many examples I could give you of how we've lowered the barriers to adopt vision screening technology. Um, but this isn't about GoCheck, so I just share all that for so you would have a little context. You know, the, the big challenges are, of course, the the small market that Josh mentioned makes raising capital difficult, and you know, the story that I've heard many times um, from pediatric innovators and also from venture capitalists on the other side of the table is that 
the, the entrepreneur walks in and says, I've got a great technology. It, in many cases, it's even clinically validated um, and you know, may even have like a regulatory clearance. Um, and the, the VC says, well, you know, how much is it going to acquire to acquire, how much is it going to cost to acquire customers? And the entrepreneur says, well, this is, these are what my models tell me. And the VC says, well, you know, come back when you have customers and you have more than models, you have actual, you know, traction, which of course is sort of a, a classic chicken and the egg, right? The entrepreneur, entrepreneur needs the capital to establish the traction, but he needs the traction to get the capital. Um, so I'll talk about how we've addressed that challenge at GoCheck. And then I will also talk about um, how have we actually acquired customers given the incredible you know, fragmentation in the market. You know, a lot of the customers um, are <laughs> one, two, three, four pediatricians. And how do we make that work economically? Um, obviously we can't have a sales rep that makes $100,000 base or anywhere close to that flying all over the country and meeting with pediatricians one at a time, um, not only will that mean a lot of kids are not screened in a timely fashion because there's a lot of you know, independent private practices, and of course it also means that if we were, if we were doing that, um, that we'd have to charge pediatricians far more than you know, the market would bear uh, to actually justify that kind of sales motion or, or go-to-market approach. And so we take a different approach which I'll also unpack for you in the hopes that it, it will save you some time and save you some money and I'll help you make a bigger difference faster. So we'll talk about the first challenge first, you know, raising capital in a small market. So I think it's important to talk about, you know, what do VCs mean by a small market? Uh, that's just computed by taking the number of customers and multiplying it by the average selling price. If there are 50,000 general pediatricians in the US, and there's some debate on whether that there's 40,000 or 55,000, and you're charging them $2,000 each, um, that's only a $100 million market, right? Which is too small, right? For most venture capitalists, they want to see a hundred, they want to see a, a billion dollar market at a minimum. Many of them want to see a $10 billion market or larger. Um, the same math, of course, works if you're charging more per specialist, maybe you're charging five, um, I'm sorry, maybe you're charging 20,000 to each specialist and you're gonna, there's 5,000 of them, you know, for, for some specialties. And so, you know, that also gets you to a hundred million. And since VCs again, want a market that's 10 times larger, um, they're gonna look at pediatrics and say, I'm not gonna get a large enough return, right? Venture capital requires venture scale returns and it's not gonna come, um, in all likelihood from, from this market, unless you have some you know, wild approach to acquiring customers that is outrageously efficient. And so how, how have we kind of overcome this challenge, um, you know, particularly in our, our storytelling, right? So for starters, we have been communicating a platform story from the outset. So we've communicated that this Trojan horse of our first product, which is vision screening for one to five-year-olds, um, will be a platform that we can build on. And depending on the history of the company or the time um, when we were pitching, that story has varied a little bit. At some points, it was an ophthalmology story or an eye care story where we'd go from this vision screening product for one to five-year-olds to vision screening, treatment, and monitoring products for all ages you know, especially seniors where there's a lot of money flowing through the system. Um, more recently, our focus has been on building a pediatric platform or building a pediatric hub um, that enables the same pediatricians that we already serve um, to be better served more and more as we're delivering more screening functionality, more clinical utility um, to those pediatricians, you know, really forming a, a hub that enables them to do far more than they can do today and far more efficiently um, and practice far more efficiently than they currently are with also great economics, right? For them as providers. We didn't have the numbers at the very beginning, um, but in our more, more recent capital raises, we have focused a lot on the unit economics. So with an individual pediatrician or an individual clinic or an individual account that might represent more than one pediatrician, if it's a hospital, you know, what do the numbers actually look like? And the way they look, you know, for us is 
hundred percent, virtually a hundred percent of our customers stick with us quarter over quarter, year over year. Um, again, that's because the clinical utility that we deliver relative to the cost that we charge is very high. If you think about it from a logo standpoint, and these are terms you'll, of course, need to know when you're pitching VCs. In other words, how many accounts you have, um, we, there, there's an asymptote of 100%. You can't actually get larger than that, right? And we are darn close to that 100% that asymptote. If you think about it from a revenue standpoint, you can be more than 100% because even if you lose a customer, let's just say they're for the sake of uh, illustration, that customer is paying you $10 a month, but you kept 99 other customers and each of those customers is paying you um, an extra, let's say 30 cents, right? Then your revenue retention actually is greater than 100%, despite the fact that you lost a customer. And our revenue retention is greater than 100%, which is you know, a meaningful standard to VCs. Um, our margins are about 70%, our gross margins, and they're growing. You know, VCs want to hear about your gross margins as well as your contribution margins, um, and ours are, are very solid. And it, as important as the absolute number is, um, how our margins has increased over time, in other words, the slope of our gross margins, um, is also something that VCs can appreciate because they look at that and say, okay, you clearly uh, have a track record of, of improving this, and therefore we're confident that you're going to keep improving it. Um, and because our retention is so high and we don't spend an outrageous amount of money acquiring customers, we have a lifetime value to CAC ratio or customer acquisition cost um, that is greater than three. There's an awesome article that I forgot to put into the slides, but it's called SaaS Metrics 2.0. It's by David Scott on the Four Entrepreneurs website. If you're selling a subscription product, you want to be very intimate with all of the terms in that article and be able to communicate where they're at when you're pitching a, a VC, as well as how you expect them to grow. Um, even if you don't already have revenue, um, just the fact that you've done the modeling that shows how you expect them to grow and why you've built your assumptions the way you have will go a long way with, with VCs. Um, again, particularly if you're combining it with some of the other elements in the storytelling that, you know, and the, mech the tactics that we've found useful. Now, most of the venture capital that we have you know, pulled down or, or, or has been invested into GoCheck um, has come from long-term relationships. They, it, they, it has not come from VCs that we met on a Monday and got a term sheet from two weeks later. That does happen right in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, um, but it's not our story. So for example, on the last round, Hatteras Partners out of North Carolina led the round. Led the round. They're a biotech investor. Um, I met them when I was raising money for the company uh, over two years ago. Um, we met at JP Morgan at a dimly lit uh, hotel lobby. They knew some of our current investors. They were aware of the company before I took the helm of the company, but um, decided not to invest before I joined. Uh, of course, when it was time to raise this capital again, I got in touch with them again, and they were able to track where was the company last time I talked to them, where was it now? And we're happy enough with the progress to lead our most recent round. Um, similarly, uh, FCA and Sovereign's Capital led the prior round. And um, I had been building a relationship with um, the heads of both of those venture capital firms for several years um, before we actually needed to raise the money. And so when we raised the money, again, they had seen the progress and I was a known quantity to them. They knew um, to some extent, right? about my character, about my priorities, about um, how I lead the company. It's not like I was sending them updates every week or every month, which is not a bad tactic in some cases. Um, it's obviously very scalable if you're doing that over email. Uh, but again, there was this element of trust. And that trust, of course, goes both ways. I also trusted them because of the time that I had with them, which is important, especially if you're building a mission-driven company, you want to work with people who have the same you know, passion as you do. Um, a lot of there's a lot of scar tissue in, in Silicon Valley, especially from raising money from non-mission aligned venture capitalists that pushed the company to do things that were um, not merely unnatural, but um, not the best thing for the patient or the best thing for uh, the provider. Uh, I, th I think that 
a, a really powerful key in raising um, capital in general, but particularly for a pediatric technology is actually having um, the ability to create the product um, and everything that goes into that, including the clinical efficacy, as well as the ability to sell, whether it's selling new teammates, selling new investors, um, selling, of course, customers, uh, and having as much of that density as possible in the founding team and or the, the early team. Founding is better than early and early is better than late. Um, what I might do is just pause in a few minutes to see what questions you have before I go to the next topic. Um, so get your questions ready. Um, and then, you know, we always pitch GoCheck as a growth story, right? We talked about the actual growth over the prior year, the prior two years, um, the growth potential, and particularly in a few different areas, right? The growth potential as we sell more to our current customers, as we move into other segments, um, such as FQHCs or Head Starts or, or schools, um, again, all of which are relevant for a screening technology. Um, then also the potential to grow outside the US. So when we raised the last round, um, we had just signed a large deal for the UAE and had a few other large deals that were pretty far along the way, which communicates to the VC that our, our total addressable market is larger than those 50,000 pediatricians in the US. Um, it's, it's hard to convince them of that, of course, if you haven't actually made any of that progress. The prior venture capital round um, was shortly after we just signed a, a large deal with um, a ministry in Europe. Um, and that was the largest deal we'd ever did in the company's history. So again, that convinced or persuaded the investor that there's a global market here. This is not just a, a US application. Now, it's very dangerous, I would say, to start going internationally um, before you really have a much larger foothold in the US, even than we have today. And so I don't advise that for every company, but we did it in a GoCheck uh, situation in part because we knew it would help with, with the fundraising, which uh, we needed extra help with because, again, the market, um, you know, through most calculations, um, is, is relatively small. Now, uh, I'll, actually, I'll pause here real quick and see what questions you have about raising capital for this market before we move on to the. Hey, Kayvon, question. James, Hi. James Wall here. Can you hear us? Hey, we do. I do. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, for the insights. Uh, I think there's one or two questions in the audience. I'm going to start with one real quick. Um, so you said relationships. What about fund size? How do you think about, you know, certain certain funds are just presumably too big to play in this space? Do you even talk to them? How do you kind of identify the right size investors for you in addition to relationships? Yeah, that's an awesome question. I wish I was uh, thoughtful enough to bring it up before it was asked. Um, we pay a lot of attention to both fund size as well as vintage or when the last round was raised. So um, for example, in our most recent fundraising, I had a spreadsheet and every, by every VC firm name, um, was the vintage. And I was just looking at the last few years, um, ideally the last two years. Um, I rarely would reach out to a VC if, it, if their vintage was more than four years old. Um, but I really, again, focused on the last two years. And then on the, the fund, fund size, you know, we think about that at GoCheck uh, relative to how much capital we're raising, right? And so if we're going to raise uh, a $10 million round, which we did for the most recent fundraise, it doesn't make sense to talk to $5 billion funds. Um, it doesn't make sense to talk to $50 million funds. A $50 million fund isn't going to put 20% of their most recent um, raise into one company. And a $5 billion fund it wants to write much, much larger checks right, than we were looking for. We wanted a lead investor to write a $6 million check and then a few other follow-on investors to write $1 or $2 million checks. Um, and so it's about kind of that Goldilocks, you know, balance or, or kind of in between place of not being too small with the fund size or, or too large. Um, I had to check my spreadsheet to remember exactly what were we targeting. Um, this was six months ago and, uh, there's been many aspects of my life and work that have been a blur since then. Um, but I think we were looking at, uh, funds that were in the 500 million 
to like one billion dollar range for the last the last fundraise. And let me know, let me know, Dr. Wall, if I missed any part of your question. No, that's great. And I, uh, I'd never heard the vintage described so nicely. It's, it's like shopping for wine uh, for a venture fund. Uh, but it's, a, it's a really important point. We have one other question in the audience here. Uh, thank you um, for your talk. I really like the um, platform story concept and trying to use this for other platforms. But how do you balance focusing on your initial market versus trying to sell the potential in the future? And how do you know when to start expanding? Yeah, that's a, again, I think a very insightful question. I think it's, you know, the way that a venture capitalist at Kleiner Perkins described this to me is how Mark Zuckerberg did it when he was pitching this VC. Um, this VC was at uh, Excel when, when Mark pitched them successfully, obviously. Uh, and there's many aspects of you know, what Mark uh, does that I, I don't try to emulate, but this is, this is, I think, one where he did a fantastic job. And that was to differentiate between the vision and the roadmap, right? So the roadmap is what we're working on right now, next month, and let's say the rest of the year. In his case, it was entirely focused on college students and um, the features had zero extensibility in many cases to the larger market that Mark wanted to reach when he turned Facebook into a utility, right? He wanted it to be like a, the phone book. Everybody has it, everybody's on it or in it. Um, and so on his roadmap was building features that help students in a particular dorm or residence hall connect with other students in the same residence hall. That's obviously useless, right? For, you know, a 45 year old, um, you know, male programmer or a 37 year old, you know, uh, female doctor, right? But it, it helped him to, to reach incredible penetration with college students. And so his roadmap was entirely focused on the, fun the value proposition that they're selling today. Um, but the vision was was obviously for for everybody, and you know the way the way he did it, of course, was you know masterful because every sequential next step of marketing and sales was tied to the logical functionality or way to deliver value for that um, next segment. And he picked, and they picked, you know, one segment after another, like the bowling pins that Jeff Moore describes in Crossing the Chasm so that they could actually um, have a mutual reinforcement. In other words, every dollar that they spent got them more users and more engagement than the last dollar um, because they, were, they, they had the customers that they just acquired helping them acquire the next set of customers. And so, yeah, I hope I'm trying to, it's a, I think it's a much larger answer to your very insightful question, but I think it's really important to differentiate between the roadmap and the vision, because otherwise it's very confusing for the team. The team could be off working on aspects of the vision before you've gotten the penetration um, to make the vision credible. And similarly, uh, investors will think you're unfocused if you're working on aspects of the vision before you're, you have incredible penetration and you know, even customer love and affection, um, wherever you're starting, which you might call your, your beachhead customer segment. Fantastic. All right, Cave, uh, there's no other questions in the room for the moment. So we'll, we'll hold a few more for the end, but let you move on to challenge number two. Okay. So um, challenge number two is good news because this is the last challenge I'm covering. So if you don't like what you're hearing, you don't have to... Um, you don't have to bear with us for very much longer. Um, so customer fragmentation, right? Or customers being very dispersed, many of them being very small. And then how do you actually acquire those customers efficiently um, is, is this another major problem associated with the pediatric market. You know, it, it's, it's not terrible to have customer fragmentation in a massive market, um, but it's, it's, this is like a double whammy to have customer fragmentation in a relatively small market. And so, um, you know, this, this, you know, uh, these bright colored uh, circles are um, a segue between the last topic of raising capital for a small market and customer fragmentation, because you can see that um, it's relevant to both. Number one, these additional segments do make the market larger. In fact, school districts and schools are a significantly larger market than the pediatric market. 
Um, they have some overlapping needs, and of course they have some non-overlapping or unique needs. Um, for us, we the first way we thought about customer fragmentation, again, is back to those bowling pins. Um, we, we asked the question, you know, where could we super serve or, or uh, develop a solution that is loved by the customers enough that they are actually telling their colleagues? And then um, where, where do we think the customers will actually tell their colleagues? Um, from a sales and marketing perspective, we obviously care a lot also about how quickly can this customer make a decision? Um, and as you can see, there's no perfect row here. There's no perfect segment for us. They all have um, at least some yellow and all but one of them have some red, right? And so ultimately we picked pediatricians in private practice to start um, because as a new venture, we were unlikely at that point in you know, 2015 to convince a large hospital system to go with us. Uh, we, we realized that while there might be some that are more kind of innovation oriented, and today there are far more, right? Um, because of the, the work of the various you know, consortiums and um, the initiatives that are very focused on pediatric innovation. Um, but, even, but even today, I would say you, you will actually get uh, your first 20 customers a lot faster if you're finding innovative private practices than if you're trying to find 20 innovative hospital systems. Um, so that, that's where we got our start. And that's where, you know, 90% of our first 500,000 in annual recurring revenue came from. Um, but then we, we obviously started to market to hospital systems. And today, um, fast forward, you know, a few years into this approach, we now have about 55% of our customers coming from, are actually in the hospital system category. Um, and that equates to about 50 of the more innovative hospital systems in the US. Um, now we have school nurses and schools, we have Head Starts, we have FQHCs as customers because they call us, um, but we don't actually spend our sales and marketing dollars today because there's back to the focus question around a platform story a few minutes ago. I, I really believe that if you're going to grow quickly, it's gonna be because your product and your sales and marketing resonate deeply. For your sales, marketing, and product to resonate deeply, that means that you have to learn um, in a, on a long-term basis very intensely, um, meaning you, can, you have to have more than superficial understanding to create that level of resonance. Well, to learn uh, intensely and act accordingly, um, you have to be focused, right? You can't, you can't go to that level of depth if you spread a small organization very thin um, across multiple, lots and lots of segments. In fact, um, I, I restarted GoCheck. I wasn't the original founder. Um, and the CEO who was running the company before me was incredible in so many ways and superior to me as a CEO in so many ways. But one thing I realized after I joined was this company um, has, has marketing and sales and product development spread across every segment you're seeing on the screen. And we're not actually winning with any of them. And by winning, I don't mean um, some arbitrary definition. I mean, delivering the unit economics that VCs care about that would justify them putting capital in the company um, you know, on a standalone basis, or what I mean by specifically because of the unit economics, which are one of the many factors they look at, including uh, in addition to market characteristics such as size and customer fragmentation. Now, uh, today we're focused on these two segments, pediatricians in private practice and hospital systems, and a big reason is because of the word of mouth potential. But today it's not potential. We have more leads coming in from uh, pediatricians telling other pediatricians than any other activities from our market, any other marketing activities um, or sales activities that we're doing. Um, but just a few kind of very practicals that hopefully save you some money and time. Showing up at conferences or speaking at them hasn't generated customer growth for us. What has is running campaigns before we get to the conference to drive, to set up meetings and also traffic to our booth. What hasn't worked is signing up one clinic, clinic that's a part of a large hospital system and just hoping it's gonna grow organically. Um, there's actually a science to running a campaign that involves a champion 
a clinical champion at the centerpiece of that campaign to get broad customer adoption inside of that hospital. And we're getting better at that, but I would say we still haven't mastered it. Um, there are times where we've hired very expensive um, MBAs and, and other you know, suits who had a great pedigree, but didn't have the overwhelming passion for pediatric health or protecting the potential and learning of children in our case. Um, and that it hasn't worked out. I mean, there's so many obstacles or so many barriers as an entrepreneur in entrepreneurship in general. And then you layer on the, the sort of the headwinds in pediatric health. And unless you're willing to run through walls because you care deeply, right, about these patient outcomes, um, this isn't, this isn't, you're not going to last, I don't think. And those people certainly haven't lasted at GoCheck. And so instead, right, we've hired missionaries, ideally who have the same level of skills, but sometimes not so much, and making them equity partners so that as they're running through those walls, it's actually worth it for them financially in the, in the long term. Um, and then I'd say hiring digital marketing consultants that have flashy websites to generate leads for us hasn't been effective. What has is high tempo testing that's very gritty, where we're looking at every idea that we can think of possible and getting a lot of ideas from others online, um, you know, reading articles, for example, and then prioritizing those based on three characteristics or attributes. If this works, what will the impact be? Is this gonna help us get 10 more pediatricians or 500 pediatricians? What's our confidence that this is gonna work? This is a, a judgment, right? Or, or, or a probability assessment. And then how easy is this to actually try to run this experiment? Is it gonna take a day of one person's time or is it gonna take a month of five people's time? Uh, is it gonna take $500 to run or is it gonna take $20,000 to run? And then we actually select the highest ICE experiments. We run them, and then we take all those learnings, we put them in a database so that the next person to join our team can go and read the experiments that we've already done and come up with better ideas and certainly not repeat the ones that we've already done that were not fruitful. Now. Uh, the last slide I have here is just to say that I think given these challenges, it behooves us as, uh, as pediatric innovators to partner together, you know, whether it's just sharing knowledge about different customer segments um, or specific, even specific customers um, or actually proactive collaboration, right? Where we are uh, working together to acquire customers. So we've got you know, now almost 7,000 pediatric teams, right? If you had a great solution, um, it, it would make all the sense in the world, right? For GoCheck to, to, you know, help you acquire those customers. There's a variety of ways that could look, but I'm not here to sort of pitch you on collaborating. My point is that we as an industry should be collaborating and there's um, lots of ways that could look. I think as a, as, a, as a team, if you will, trying to make a difference in these um, patients' lives, we're going to accomplish a lot more than if we try to do everything ourselves. Um, and there's lots of, there's a road of well-intentioned pediatric entrepreneurs who are no longer working on pediatric innovation because they couldn't raise the capital and acquire the customers fast enough while they were trying to do everything themselves. So I'll pause there now. I think we might have just a minute or two for questions or as much as Dr. Wall and the team says we have. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much. I think, um, I'm going to refer questions to you offline just because we have to take a little break here. And then we have one more session um, that was wonderfully insightful. And, and I think, you know, that last point of, you know, really understanding as an entrepreneur, how, how hard it is to get a digital solution into the hands of a fragmented market. Um, thinking about ways that we can collaborate as an industry, uh, I think is really important. So I uh, look forward to future conversations about that. Thank you so much for joining us from uh, Cleveland from on your trip. And a uh, round of applause from the audience for Kayvon. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.